You good? Okay. So welcome everybody to our uh, virtual Facebook live event. Uh, we've all been quarantined for a while. I actually uh, shaved for the first time in 10 days for you, so you don't have to see me as a lumberjack. But uh, today we're joined with uh, Shalene Fisher, who's our esthetician at Zuliani Facial Aesthetics, and we're going to sort of go over some things related to anti-aging, both surgical and non-surgical. So we're going to be mostly an educational thing, so you guys can ask questions throughout, um, and we'll have uh, Facebook up so we can answer any of your questions. Feel free to interject at any time. Um, we'll also discuss, if you want me to, a little bit about what's going on in the world and how soon things might go back to normal in the realm of plastic surgery, and we can talk about that as well. For the time being, however, we're going to abide by the CDC and WHO recommendations. Obviously, I think we're starting to get to the apex here in Michigan um, in terms of cases and bed usage. Um, and, you know, we're doing all our part to, to flatten that curve. However, as we reach the apex of the curve, that doesn't mean we just sort of uh, take our foot off the brakes, as uh, our medical leaders, like Dr. Fauci, has said, we sort of have to keep that going in terms of surgery. It's probably gonna be May to mid-May before the hospitals feel comfortable undergoing elective procedures. And at that, at that time, we'll probably have some recommendations from our uh, boards and our plastic surgery associations as to how to proceed with patients and safety uh, going forward. Obviously that's paramount. Uh, I think that there's gonna be uh, increased need for testing as well as for uh, antibody tests to see if you've been exposed and that should sort of loosen things up for people to go back into society as as much as sort of normal can be. There are some good um, treatments on the horizon. I know everybody's thought about hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil and it seems like the data is sort of not there completely in terms of this being a sort of wonder drug. It, it does seem to work uh, quick, uh, better if it's, uh, you know, if the disease is picked up quicker and you start this uh, earlier, there are some uh, problems with it, especially if people have pre-existing heart problems and arrhythmias. And you wanna also make sure your magnesium is uh, strong if you do take that. However, there's new, there's new things in the pipeline um, such, uh, such as synthetic antibodies, which may bridge us um, until the time of a vaccine comes about, which is probably gonna be a full year, but if the synthetic antibodies can get rushed through and processed and the FDA can clear it within a month or two months, this is really gonna be something that we can inject and it probably will last two months. And then we probably need another injection to keep this um, horrible disease at bay. But anyways, today's uh, lecture is going to be about anti-aging options, what's right for you. It's going to basically focus on treatment of the lower face and neck. Um, and I haven't operated in about three and a half weeks, and I'm really missing it. The only knife I have in my hand is for cooking purposes. And uh, it's not as delicate, and I'm not as gentle with uh, food as I am with faces. So that's a good thing. So uh, we're going to keep going. The next slide here is sort of what causes facial aging. And to tell you the truth, a lot of it is genetics. A lot of it is how our facial skeletons are built. A lot has to do with ethnicity and gender. The darker your skin tone, sort of the, the better that your skin holds up in terms of wrinkles. So people who, what we call our Fitzpatrick fours up to sixes, meaning darker skinned individuals, Middle Eastern patients, Asian patients, Hispanic patients, and African American patients, we see that they do not have as intense of the fine crepe and wrinkling as uh, patients who perhaps have red hair, blue eyes, and uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, where the skin damage can really take a toll and cause what's called solar elastosis, which allows the elastin in the skin to fragment, the, the collagen in the skin to fragment, and then what do we see? We see sagging skin, and sometimes this happens to a greater degree at a younger age, especially if there was a lot of sun exposure younger, and especially if um, environmental factors such as smoking 
have been done. So all uh, diet, smoking, ethnicity, gender, and genetics all play a part. So some things you can change and some things you cannot. So the things that you can change is if you do smoke, put them down and throw them away. Uh, and if you do sunbathe, make sure that you're covering up as much as possible with a hat and using good SPF protection and reapplying every two hours. The genetics thing is sort of just, that's sort of the, uh, the hand you were dealt. And so there are things that we can do to help with that, but mostly in terms of genetics, it relates to the neck and it relates to the skeletal structure in and around the jaw. Uh, and we'll get to uh, talking about that a little bit. So for facial rejuvenation, what do we like to discuss? And I call it the four R's. It's redraping, and that's a surgical uh, thing where we um, lift the tissues and reposition them. We can relax, and that's with neuromodular such as Botox or Dysport or Juvo, and everybody knows about the benefits of those. We can resurface, and this is what I call the icing on the cake, and what Shaleen will be talking about a little bit later, is that surgery does not affect the skin per se. Now, it can pull it and reposition, and fat can cause, fat injections cause the skin to look better itself, but in reality, to, to affect the skin and to cause it to have a nice luminosity, you need to have some sort of energy delivered to the skin itself, whether that's in the form of a broadband light, whether that's in the form of a laser. A laser is very different than BBL, and Shalene will get into that. A laser is what's called collimated light that's all in the same wavelength. So it's all traveling in the same wavelength, and it can be directed to do uh, a variety of things in medicine. And what we're trying to aim for in um, rejuvenation of the face is that we're targeting water, and water is the target that the laser is attracted to. Sometimes uh, we can use it for other things such as uh, pigment, but in reality to smooth up the skin, it's water. And then refilling. In terms of a surgical refill, that is fat. We'll go over a couple of cases where I've used fat to rejuvenate and to reposition as well as to augment certain areas. And obviously we know that, and obviously we know that um, uh, fillers, like off the shelf fillers can be used as well. That was a little bit of that British prime minister video there. My son was right in the, uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, the screen there. So what exactly is a facelift? So uh, this is uh, widely debated. There are a whole bunch of things out there in the medical literature, as well as in the uh, advertising sections of, um, you know, beauty, new beauty and glamour, cosmopolitan, as well as on the internet, like Instagram, and everybody uh, sort of uh, taglining some sort of way that a facelift is performed. And if you ask five different plastic surgeons what a mini lift is, they'll all, they'll all give you five different answers. So what I'm gonna give you is what my approach to these things are. You know, people say, do I do the ponytail lift? I don't know what that is. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people will sort of uh, trademark and uh, do certain things. I, I've actually done the same thing and I'm gonna explain exactly what my trademark is on the facelift. So a facelift is a, a surgical procedure which lifts and repositions totic, and totic in uh, medicine means droopy, droopy tissues. And to do that, we know that we have to, re we have to reposition the underlying tissues underneath the skin. And that is called the SMAS layer, S-M-A-S, SMAS layer. And to reposition that, there are a variety of techniques. Some are very aggressive and some are less aggressive. And not, not everybody needs the most aggressive type lift, which is usually a release of the retaining ligaments of the face and what's called a high SMAS or lamellar lift or a deep plane facelift, all of which I perform, but not does every, everybody does not necessarily need those. Um, in terms of what's the difference between a facelift and a neck lift, a neck lift is basically repositioning and tightening up the muscular layers of the neck, as well as removing any fat. A fat above the uh, muscle, which is called the platysma in the neck, can be accomplished by a liposuction. And fat, which is stubborn or underneath that muscle, is called subplatysmal fat, and that a lot of times needs to be sculpted and removed. 
So what does a facelift not treat? It does not treat the eyelids or the brows. When people say, what is a full facelift? Well, to me, that means a full incision facelift. That does not mean a full brow lift in, a, in addition to that. A brow lift can be done a, a variety of ways. There are open brow lifts, endoscopic brow lifts. Each has its own merit and each has its own um, expected sequelae, meaning that in a brow lift, a lot of times the least invasive option often moves the hairline back. And in patients who have a high hairline, you may want to consider an open brow lift. But with that, leads a larger incision and possibility for scarring or what's called paresthesias, which causes tingling in the scalp. So all these things need to be discussed with your surgeon at the time of your consultation, as well as your preoperative appointment. A facelift does not remove the fine lines around the mouth, and they're called smoker's lines, even though that most people do not smoke. These lines form just because of the way in which the muscles oriented around the mouth. The muscle around the mouth, the main one, is called the orbicularis oris. It is a circular muscle and acts as a sphincter, and that's why you can kiss or pucker your mouth. Those fibers of that muscle run around the mouth in a circle, and the sort of dictum to all of this is that in the way in which that the muscles fibers run, your wrinkles form perpendicular to it. So in the forehead, the frontalis muscle travels this way, the muscle fibers run this way, and that's why when you raise your eyebrows, the wrinkles form that way. So around the mouth, when you purse your lips, that's why those, those smoker lines form. Now there's lots of things to do about it. And when they become very deep and very etched in the skin after many years of doing it, those actions or after sun damage, the best way to take care of them is usually a multimodal approach with a small amount of neurotoxin or neuromodulator as well as deep resurfacing. And a facelift doesn't restore lost value, meaning as we age, the reasons we get droopy skin and droopy tissues in our face as well as down in this area here, which is called jowling, is because our face is attached at certain points. And where those are attached, or where it's attached is here. There's ligaments attaching here. That's why things don't fall this way, as well as into the jaw. So everything descends this way as you get old. And so, you know, I explain to uh, consults when I see them in person that a lot of times everybody's looking like this. So the everything is, the face shape is heavy at the bottom, looking like an egg. And the whole goal of facial rejuvenation is to turn the egg upside down and make the widest part of the face up here and things to taper down. And so we can reposition those droopy tissues with the facelift surgery. There's certain techniques such as a SMAS facelift or a lamellar face, high lamellar lift or high SMAS lift and a deep plane facelift, which is the most powerful, which can really lift those tissues up. Now, a lot of patients are blessed with just high cheekbones and good muscular density, or I should say skeletal density in the cheekbones, as well as in the back of the jaw, which is called the gonial angle. It's what people call snatched these days. It's this real tight area right there. And so we see a lot of patients who want that, and we can treat that with filler. But as the tissues get droopier and droopier and the fat and fat seems to accumulate, we need to use surgery to cause a really lasting approach because that, that bone, uh, unfortunately, is not going to get its density back uh, in the cheeks nor in that gonial angle. So we can reposition and with certain surgical techniques to tighten the muscle and that SMAS layer around that bone, we can really cause a nice effacement and uh, a definition of the jaw. So I do get this question a lot, what's the ideal age? And it really depends. I see patients in their late 30s who could benefit from a facelift. And I see patients in their 50s to 60s as well as later who could benefit from a facelift. The expectation is to be tailored though. Those, those patients who present earlier have to understand there's a little bit of a downtime with these procedures. And a lot of younger patients have children and you may not wanna take a week to 10 days and even sometimes even longer, up to two weeks off of life if you have younger children. Now that doesn't mean you can't care for them, but you have to understand that you have to have time to let your body heal. The ideal age when I see patients who are presenting for face-off is usually between the ages of 48 and 58. And that 
that's because the skin has a decent amount of elasticity still at that age, where when we do the facelift procedure, there isn't the intrinsic want of the skin to relax. So there's some good elasticity still in the skin. So, so we want to um, reposition that uh, tissue and in doing so we can cause there to be a little bit more longevity if we act earlier. That doesn't mean that people don't necessarily want a secondary lift. It's not really called a revision facelift, it's called a secondary lift many years down the line. And we'll get to that in, in terms of longevity. We'll talk about just how long these sort of treatments last. So who, who presents to me? So I, I do see a lot of um, women and men who are in the sales force um, and uh, perhaps have their kids uh, out of the home and now want to do something for themselves. Uh, and not others, which is great. It also often corresponds to, you know, maybe an increased exercise regime, maybe teeth whitening, um, things of that nature. Uh, and we did discuss the um, acting earlier rather than later. So getting into motivations, the, the surgery and plastic surgery in general is different than any other type of surgery because the patients are asking us as plastic surgeons to fix something or to help them with something which isn't medically necessary. This is not uh, dealing with tumors. This is not dealing with a major accident where, you know, th that type of in invasive procedure is needed to take care of this. This is something that people want done for themselves. And it's uh, for somebody, for people who want to look their best. And we understand that at ZFA that this is a very sort of different type of doctor patient relationship because it involves the patient seeking out the physician to do work to make their uh, self-esteem, their confidence and psychological benefit um, to be profound. Uh, in terms of um, work pressures, I do see a lot of women in their, uh, and men as well, in the sales force who, um, feel like they may be being pushed out for a, a younger, um, a younger uh, worker who doesn't necessarily have the wisdom and, um, and not necessarily um, do these patients feel like they should be out of the workforce or old or don't have anything left to contribute to society. They just wanna remain what they're doing and they're, the projection that they feel inwards isn't being portrayed outward. And that is simply as a matter of fact from those three things I mentioned earlier, genetic, uh, environmental factors and the sun. So it is completely okay and it is completely normal for you to want to look your best. And it is, there is no stigma associated with it these days. It is a multi-billion dollar industry whether people want to admit it or not, everybody's doing a little bit of something. And with the advent of reality shows and other um, sort of infomercial type things, you can see the general acceptance of these surgeries as well as other treatments in the public. So this begs to the other questions I as I uh, was talking about earlier is how young will I look? Well, it's, it is not going, going to um, take you back to your 20s. That's, it's really not going to do that. But realistically, if you have a picture of how you look 10 years prior, it's probably going to jive with that. You know, in our um, beauty magazines, rarely do we see women in their 50s, really, or 60s. It's every, every women think they look their best. Uh, and this is a, from a survey done, I think back in 2008 or 2010, one of the plastic surgery journals, I can't remember the article, but women thought they looked their best at the age of 36 to 38. Um, men, on the other hand, the same women rated that the men look their best in their 50s. Now, it's probably not fair and it's, um, you know, men get distinguished and, you know, I hear that complaint all the time. Um, but in reality, the same things are happening to men. And you know, as, as probably as much as 20% of my 
consultation business is men seeking aging face surgery, whether it's related to their brows or their lids or even their necks. Um, it is becoming more commonplace for men to do that as well. So everybody, you know, will say, oh, look at the jawline. I want Angelina jo Jolie's jawline. Or I want Kim Kardashian's nose. Or, but, you know, these things are very, you know, I can only, and all this plastic surgery can only work with what, you know, the patient presents to us with. If the skeletal structure isn't as strong, say, as Angelina Jolie's, there's no way that anybody can give the definition that... Um, is so desired. So, you know, this requires in-depth conversation, realistic expectations. And the best way to do that is to look at before and after pictures. Um, but in reality, what we're aiming for is this criteria of a youthful neck where there is a distinct mandibular border. There is a, what's called a subhyoid depression or in, right below the throat here, there is a little depression we can see a little bit of the cartilaginous bulge in men, that's called the Adam's apple. We want to be able to see a little bit of the neck muscle, which is called the sternocleidomastoid muscle, allows us to rotate our heads laterally. We want to see a nice crisp neckline here. And so how's it done? Well, surgically, there are um, what's called short scar facelifts or mini lifts. Uh, and they're called uh, full incision facelifts. And it all, it all relates to where we need to work. Basically, if patients have just jowling and a small amount of laxity in their neck, we can do a short incision facelift where we do not come all the way back around the ear and into the hairline, but we can stop behind the earlobe itself and elevate these tissues and elevate the neck to some degree uh, and that is basically dependent on who presents and how they present. We can get to that smash layer from that same incision. Other surgeons will call that their ponytail lift um, because you can put your hair back and you're not to be able to see any sort of incisions in the back. However, I've rarely run into any problems with full incision facelifts. So the elevation is done where that green um, circles called it, that subcutaneous. Head. That means we're lifting the skin up. And then in our more advanced type lifts, we are going to go underneath that layer called the SMAS. And it acts as a sort of viscoelastic um, amplifier of the um, facial muscles that allow us to really have them work in combination. So as we go underneath there, there are certain ligaments we want to release in order to be able to pull and lift the tissues that have been droopy. Not everybody needs that though. However, if people have just mild jowling and present to me at 50, they don't need specifically a huge, large, deep, plain facelift um, to accomplish those goals. Now, as if maybe people present at 50 with really droopy tissues and heavy neck, now that's the best way to accomplish that. And I want to thank uh, one of my former residents, Dr. Danny Suarez, who's a, a surgeon down in Florida. He gave me these past two uh, slides. So I, I want to give him credit for um, these slides. So the types of facelifts are plicating, resecting, or extended. So plicating means that you are just tying tissue upon itself. So there's like a little bit of a fold. It can uh, if you pull sort of a, a bed sheet and there's a little fold and you tighten it up a little bit. Resecting obviously means that you're cutting out redundant tissue, and then lifting that tissue and imbricating or suturing it back to its normal tissue again, thereby lifting it and cutting out the redundant tissue. And then these extended facelift techniques are what I was talking about earlier with these high SMAS or lamellar facelifts, as well as the deep plane facelifts. So is the facelift the same as a neck lift? Well, depends who you ask and what's being done. Uh, I have done isolated neck lifts without doing any facelift incisions here. It really depends upon the laxity of skin as well as muscle in the neck. A lot of times we need to reduce that laxity in the neck by either adding what's an energy source to tighten that up or by lifting it. Uh, and 
each case, like I said earlier, is, is determined individually. We go over all the options, the downtime associated with all of these and determine which is best for the patient. So this is just an isolated neck lift. And a lot of times neck lifts are, uh, we need to combine with a little bit of chin augmentation. As this is also true with facelifts because if the chin isn't as developed, what's gonna happen is the neck is gonna have a poor cervical mental angle. So if the chin is underdeveloped, we need to stretch that skin out further to tighten that skin up. It's just a pure matter of stretching. Cutting the skin out from this incision blunts it even more. So in this patient, we've inserted a chin implant as well as did a fair amount of liposuction above that platysma muscle. And then did a neck lift. What that means to me is my neck lift means a submentoplasty, meaning I'm going in, un, in an incision created in the submental crease or the crease right below your chin, going in, tightening that platysma muscle up with what's called a platysmoplasty. And we do what's called a corset platysmoplasty. And before we tighten that layer up, we remove all and sculpt all that fat that relates there. And I can do this. This is something we can do with the patient awake with under just some mild oral um, anxiolytic or um, like a Valium or, and some pain medicine. Or if the patient chooses, we can go to the operating room and do this. This is the same sort of in-office chin implant neck lift where I did not excise any skin. Um, the patient had a good elastic recall. These patients were in their 30s to early 40s. And so there was no need for us to excise any skin. So that begs the question, who does need something excised? Or what is there? what can we do in the interim if we don't want to excise any skin? Is there any in between? So that in between involves using hybrid procedures, surgical procedures combined with energy delivery. Okay, so energy can be delivered via the form of radio frequency. And you've heard a lot about that recently. Every company has a radio frequency machine. Uh, it is basically energy delivered in trying to injure the skin to try and tighten that collagen up and cause degradation of the old collagen and laying down of collagen and elastin, which is new and tight. There's ultrasound that has uh, been used in the past uh, as well as laser. So my trademark thing is what's called the Z lightning lift. It involves using um, the Renuvion technology, which is radio frequency, which is, which is uh, placed through helium, which is called, now called plasma. So the uh, plasma energy is energy through a medium and the uh, lightning is such uh, an example of plasma energy. This is a example of delivering um, a surgical uh, sample uh, from Diane Duncan back approximately eight years ago, showing the delivery of energy and what it does. And what this is showing, this isn't a uh, spider web or cheese or anything like this. This is actually, if you were to cut underneath the skin and look how the fat is connected to the deeper layers and the deep muscular layers of tissue, you see these large open spaces there on your left. And what radio frequency does is it not only contracts those spaces and causes them to tighten, but it also degrades the collagen in the dermis, which is above here, and allows it to be reformed and uh, come back as a nice tighter, when you see it will be tighter, what's called fibrils or the little waves, it'll be nice and tight. So this is what the energy does. So this allows us to do Tightening procedures that are non-excisional, meaning we don't have to cut skin away. Now we can combine these with excisional procedures to try and give the maximal improvement in terms of lifting and tightening at the same time. So this is a little uh, example of the Renuvion being used in the neck where we are allowed, we're tightening the skin up and accentuating that mandibular border here. And you see the smoke being pulled away. That's what's called a plume. 
so they're being delivered through helium. So we don't really worry about the skin being affected too much externally. We don't cause there to be a burn in the skin. And that's the incision there. You can see the tightening. And the improvement happens over immediately as well as over the course of three months as that collagen degradation and, and reformation occurs. So, you know, the result doesn't just stop after two weeks, it actually improves. Um, this is another procedure. It can, it shows basically it looks like E.T.'s finger in the neck. It's on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> So that is, a, so this is a result of just me not doing any platysmoplasty, no liposuction. All I did is elevate the skin of the neck and use the Renuvion to tighten it. You can see the improvement. Basically, if you take a look at those horizontal bands, the, these, these lines here, you can see how much they're effaced. So you get a lot of improvement there. What happens is that the energy is so hot that we think that it uh, degrades a little bit of that superficial fat too and causes it to just die. So you see some improvement along the jowls as well on the, uh, from the left-hand side to the right. Now this can be combined with other things. So on this patient, uh, which was a secondary lift, she already had a facelift years ago. What we did is we opened up the neck, we tied those muscles together, those two bands performed a little bit of conservative liposuction up on the jowls here, and then used the machine to tighten everywhere. And this is a, a result after three months. Again, same thing here. This is a man. We did a chin implant, and we're removing that pre as well as sub fat and trying to accentuate that neckline. Now, this patient received it was a, what's called a short scar face of a mini facelift. The incision, even though she has a lot of excess skin here, we're able to use our Renuvion in the neck to cause all that tightening. So the incision was made here. This was able to lift the skin up here. And then no midline neck work, no incision to tighten the muscles here. Just pulling this and tightening this up and using that Renuvion to tighten that skin. She's 70 years old, so she looks great. So here's some more uh, pictures. Again, neck lift, platysmoplasty, liposuction. This is in office, wide open patient was awake, using some liposuction to remove the fat, get trying to really define that jawline, tighten that muscle up. So downtime for a procedure like that is about seven to 10 days where everything's pretty swollen and we have to wear a little compression dressing. <coughs> Excuse me. After that, uh, you can wear a little compression dressing just at night. After two weeks, things are much better. We really uh, try and pamper you in terms of getting um, uh, lymphatic massages, help uh, all that swelling disappear as, as soon as possible, and go over all um, sort of post surgical makeup to try and disguise things, uh, as well as we discuss certain things that I believe in our diet that can be pro inflammatory, and I go over that. Uh, in detail with all my patients. This is a mini lift uh, that was done in the operating room. Uh, this is combined with other ancillary procedures. Obviously, all these things can be combined with uh, brow lifts, blefts. Uh, on this patient, it was a lip lift uh, to decrease the uh, distance between the nose and the upper lip, which gives us a little bit more fullness and shortens that distance. Uh, people uh, recently are beginning to, you know, the long upper lip disguising the, um, the thin, the, you know, disguising the fullness of the lip as well as it being thin where the red lip has been disappearing. We can do surgically uh, lift that up. Filler will not lift. Well, that is a, a big, um, big thing that uh, people seem to feel like filler can lift. F filler will be able to move the lip out and get add some uh, volume, but it does not it does not accomplish it does not make a height issue any better. Height issue can only really be uh, tackled with a surgical procedure such as a lip lift. But here we can see the improvement in the neck, the light jowling, and from the side, what we want to do. 
This is a more aggressive facelift uh, where we really had to release all that, uh, those retaining ligaments, um, deep plane facelifts, and we also did a little fat transfer here. Deep plane facelifts really cause you to be swollen more, a little bit longer because we are doing more what's called surgical dissection, meaning I'm elevating more. When you elevate more, you tend to have a little bit more swelling. That being said, it's not, you know, after two weeks, you're presentable. It's not really until you're th the third week of, after such a procedure where you'd want to schedule any sort of engagement. But this is the deep plane facelift. You can see the volume even up underneath the eye is improved because we were able to move that up. Now she also had some fat injection be, uh, up in the upper, or the, I should say the middle third of the face to try and volumize that. You can see that the difference between the left and the right, sort of the angle of the mesolabial fold is straight down. And then in the other, it's out. That's because we added volume, not only with the deep plane facelift, but with our uh, fat injection as well. You also can see the effacement of this, which is called the labial mental crease. And this is from the front could see the large excess platysmal band and skin there, and that was all tightened up with our uh, aggressive lift. This is the same thing, deep plane facelift, neck lift, platysmoplasty. On this patient can really see the effacement of that labial mental crease as everything is pulled up high. If you take a look underneath the eye here, there is a tear trough deformity and it's obliterated by doing that deep plane facelift because everything is being pulled up. That's no filler and no fat, that's just the facelift. You can see her incisions over here on the, on the left-hand side where they're placed. Same thing, incisions around the ear. And from the front, that band, I got them bad are gone. Again, deep plane facelift is done with in combination with the rhinoplasty. This is a lot of swelling and a lot of downtime to do at once. But lifting those totic tissues, moving all that up. So she now has a nice cheek or malar fat pad. If we look at the difference on the left, where it's flat, the three quarter angle is flat. And now you can see it's up. And that's from doing that more aggressive a deep plane face up and she also had the rhinoplasty, which makes it look different. Last deep plane facelift where we're really elevating and smoothing out the neck skin, elevating those jowls, causing a very improved neck contour. So at, at this point, uh, I'm going to um open it up for questions and they're going to be uh, read to me i guess <laughs> by my can you, right, can you see me right now i can oh all right <laughs> i don't know if it's on facebook though i don't know if it's on the live no, they can see you it's when you talk it's when you, oh, yeah, right. you talk it, yeah. you pop up. okay okay so, cool um, you see the question Casey. okay girl's got a couple questions here and there's one also for you shaleen yep Dr. Zuliani has some questions. Okay, um, we have a question. Would a brow lift reduce the wrinkles in your forehead, reducing the need for Botox or Dysport? Uh, that's a very good question, actually. It depends on the technique. Um, an endoscopic brow lift is really done on the deeper layers of the, of the scalp, uh, meaning the we're lifting the cover up. We're going underneath the covering of the bone and lifting things up. Now that effaces those wrinkles to some degree, but the best way to do it, if you're truly concerned about the wrinkles is what's called a biplanar lift, meaning we're lifting from below and we have to make an incision up here to move that skin up. And so it, they can, uh, occasionally though, the wrinkles can be so deep and etched in the skin that really no amount of surgery or Botox is gonna take care of those. But that's a very good question. The short answer is yes, but it depends. And it depends on what type of procedure you're willing to undergo. The next question is, does the lip lift do anything for the vertical lines? No, it does not. 
So the, the vertical lines are basically um, not being able to be surgically taken care of unless we talk about resurfacing and that's sort of the icing on the cake. So the dictum basically is from here down in through here, any wrinkles or problems really can't be pulled because we're, we're not dissecting out there. Even the, the lip lift, even though it pulls up, it's not gonna really decrease those, those vertical lines at all. The only really thing is delivering energy uh, to that area or dermabrading, not microdermabrading, but dermabrading, which I don't do anymore. Some uh, physicians do. It's basically taking a Dremel and taking it to the face and just, bur just burring skin away. Um, so to answer your question, no, lip lift does not do that. Lip lift only affects height with the added benefit of adding a little bit more volume to the lip. People who've had lip lift does not does not mean that they never need filler again because there's two issues here. There's height issue and a volume issue. So uh, it may decrease the need for the amount of filler, but it, it doesn't usually um, mean that you'll never ever need filler again. It's basically a height issue. They want you to repeat the question because they can't hear me. So the first question, if you could repeat it was, would a brow lift reduce the wrinkles in your okay. forehead? Okay, so the, the first question was, will a brow lift reduce the wrinkles in your forehead? Reducing the need for Botox. Yeah, uh, reducing the need for Botox or Dysport. The short answer is it can, depending on the type of um, brow lift that you perform. Now in an endoscopic brow lift, uh, as well as a biplanar uh, brow lift, we can cut the muscle here. This is the, the corrugator muscle, okay? And that's why I get those 11s or some people have 111s. Um, and we can cut that muscle. On occasion, it reforms where you're, you need to then treat it with Botox again. The second question, if you could repeat is, does the lip lift do anything for the vertical lines? And the second question was, does a lip lift do anything for the vertical lines? And the short answer is no, it does not. The next question is, and if you could repeat it, does the Z lightning lift help with lip lifting? Does the Z lightning lip uh, lift uh, help with lip lifting? No, it does not. Those are separate procedures. Okay. This is a question more for Shaleen, but if you want to answer it, um, what is your opinion regarding retin-A slash retinoids in reducing and slowing the sagging or loss of elasticity? Does it really help or delay anything? Can it ever do more harm than good? Here, if you want to read that one out loud. Uh, what is my opinion regarding Retin-A, retinoids, and reducing the slowing or sagging or loss of elasticity? Does it, does it really help or delay anything? Can it ever do more harm than good? Okay, so uh, retinols or, or uh, retinoic acid are all derivatives of sort of vitamin A. And in fact, they have been shown to improve fine line and crepe. And the studies were done many years ago and it showed improvement underneath the eyes. What it does essentially is increase cell turnover in addition to causing some stiffening of the underlying collagen and elastin. So the skin turns over faster. And that's why you notice if you use Retin-A or any type of retinoic acid that your skin turns red and it gets dry. And that's because the skin is turning over quicker. So the normal sort of length from the bottom layer of the epidermis to the top is uh, a, a few weeks, six weeks usually. And we're trying to decrease that. And so you're seeing rapid, rapid turnover of cells. And that's why people, uh, I, often I tell my patients to slow walk it into a retinoid, basically using once every third day, once every fourth day to get your skin used to it because it can be very drying and irritating. And it also causes what's called photosensitivity, meaning if you go out in the sun, it gets, your face gets red. So you have, to be, you have to be aware of that. But the short answer is yes, it does help. Is it a magic bullet? No, it's not. Um, but you know, all these things used together, good skincare, things that energy-based de devices to make your skin more luminous and to tighten, combined with surgery and neurotoxin flows, they, all these multimodal approaches work the best. One thing in a silo and a vacuum does something, but it's, it's the sort of melding of all these things. And that's our goal is to give you a nice treatment plan of what, what you should be doing to keep up looking 
to keep looking your best. You know, rare is it that people come in for a, a facelift and then I never see them again. They're, they're, they need to do things to try and keep that skin tight and to keep things looking their best. And that means investing, whether it is a small or, or uh, a, a series of smaller procedures after a bigger surgery to keep things looking good. Um, very rare is it that it's just one and done. Now, that's not that, that's not the case for rhinoplasty. That's usually one surgery and you're done. But, but this is we're talking about aging face stuff. And you know, going back to those three things that are an issue: genetics, which we can't affect, sun uh, good uh, sunscreen, um, and trying to refill, revolumize, replace. Um, you know, that, that we need to do all those things on that spectrum in order to give the best result possible. Um, you might, so what's a good 20 year plan? Does having a Z lightning lift earlier around 53 years of age mean less of a surgical lift five years later, meaning not having to do the SMAS or deep planning? Um, do you want to read that out loud? Yeah. So, um, What's a good 20 year plan? Does having a Z lightning lift earlier uh, in the early 50s mean less of a surgical lift five years later? Meaning not having to do the SMAS or deep plane lift. I hope my terms are right. Um, good question and it depends. It sort of depends what the issues are. If the issues are slight jowling and laxity in the neck, then by far, doing a Z lightning lift is gonna give you good results that are gonna last. However, there are certain techniques like in the deep plane phase that I just cannot do in the office with you awake because they'd be so, um, I wouldn't say invasive, but they're not comfortable. You wouldn't be comfortable me doing that, that amount of dissection. So it really all depends on what the individual's goals are and what they present to me with. Some people will come in and say, I want a Z lightning lift. And I say, well, it's probably not the best choice for you because you have so much laxity here. It's very, you know, it's good for the younger population, but I've done an, I've done a Z lightning lift on an 81 year old. So, you know, it all depends. Not everybody's face is the same. Um, so not every surgery is the same. Um, I think for right now, as best I can tell, <laughs> that's all of them. Okay. Um, more them too. So I think with that, you could probably hand it over to Shalene. All right. So I am going to now hand it over to our master esthetician, Shalene Fisher. Hi, everyone. We miss seeing you in the office, but this is a nice little alternative. And I am going to talk to you about um, just a little bit more in depth about what <laughs> Dr. Giuliani was talking about as far as lasers go, and even some skincare um, that you can actually really utilize this time to really prep your skin for um, receiving some of these laser treatments when we are back in office. And then even going over um, some of the post care treatments because, like Dr. Z was saying, there's many different treatments and many different modalities that kind of encompass the whole anti-aging process. And the reason why this industry is so amazing and so wonderful is because there's something for everyone. So whether you are just, yeah. you know, getting started, whether you want to do something more aggressive, kind of getting your foot in the door and trying out some smaller lasers or just getting on a really healthy skincare regimen at home. Um, we will find the perfect plan for you. So let's just jump right in here. And I think our first one is Halo. Yes, the reason why I love Halo, shout it from the rooftops, is because it's the only hybrid fractional laser. So whereas back when, um, in order to resurface the surface of your skin, uh, the top layer, what's visible to the eye, and also to go a little bit deeper so that as we age, we see those results for quite some time, you would have had to do two or three different treatments. And in this day and age, sometimes we don't necessarily have all of that downtime. So what HALO does is it basically eliminates that process because it's using two wavelengths at the same time. And it's really the only wave, the only laser of its kind that can do that. So what that means for a patient is 
we're resurfacing the surface layer of your skin. So that's what's visible to everyone. But then we're also going using a different wavelength at the same time, simultaneously underneath. And we're treating skin that is not visible to the eye. So that's why you see the results of a halo for eight, nine, 10, 12 months. And that's what's so cool about this laser is it's kind of like your one-stop shop. You're like really getting in there, seeing some amazing results just after one treatment, rather than doing maybe eight or nine smaller treatments such as microneedling or even um, lighter re laser resurfacing treatments. It's kind of like your biggest bang for your buck. Um, you can go to the next slide, Dr. Z. I think it talks about what it treats. Let's talk about what it treats. So superficial fine lines and wrinkles. Is it going to completely eradicate those wrinkles and lines like Botox would do? Not necessarily, but it's going to smooth them out and give you a more refreshed glow. Uh, melasma, we deal with a lot of patients that come in that have hyperpigmentation, uh, melasma. Got to be a little careful when you're treating melasma with certain type of light therapies because you don't want to necessarily exacerbate it. But Halo is awesome because it's gonna calm that down. And then we get you on some really, really great skincare that's gonna basically maintain those results. Um, pigment Ill irregularities, superficial scars and texture, pore size. Like I was saying, Halo is kind of like your one-stop shop to help with pigment, help with the integrity of the te or the texture of your skin. You can't necessarily, uh, your pore size is your genetics. So you can't necessarily diminish it, but you can diminish the appearance of it. So another treatment that most of our patients are super familiar with is microneedling. Microneedling at its deepest can only go about 0 .2 millimeter, uh, 0.5 millimeters into the skin, 2.5, sorry. So halo is kind of like microneedling on steroids. The results that you would achieve with halo would probably take you over the course of a year, maybe eight to 10 treatments of microneedling. Um, over the next couple slides are some really, really great before and after pictures. Um, as you can see, it just, it's called the halo glow because it does just that. It brightens your skin, it glows your skin. How Dr. Z was talking about all these different factors such as sun, such as environmental factors, genetics. We are constantly fighting a battle of aging skin. And so what do we do? We have to use some of these lasers to combat those things. The best thing about Halo Laser is that it's good for all skin type. Fitzpatrick one through five. Um, and as we're seeing here, you can, you see amazing results with no matter what your skin type is. Um, good for all ages. These are just two little videos to kind of show you exactly what the treatment entails. I don't know if you can hear that sound, but basically what we're doing is these little dots that you see on your skin are channels of change. We're, we're inducing that energy to basically trick your skin to produce more collagen and elastin. What collagen and elastin do? Collagen really? and elastin builds up our skin. It's so different. A lot of people think the BBL is like This was actually my uncle. He was kind of a little bit of a pansy, but I'll tell you a funny story. He, um, he had a very difficult time with the treatment. <laughs> Because he thought he was going to play racquetball the next day? No. He didn't talk to me for two days. Like 10 weeks. Oh my gosh. Are you well done? About a week later, and he said, I will never admit this to anyone, but I'm going to do this treatment once a year. And I said, All right, I'm going to hold you to that. Um, Halo is awesome because it can be used any part of the body. Uh, great for neck tightening great for reducing sun damage on our face, neck, and decollete. You always want, as you age, everything to be blended in. If we concentrate with doing so many treatments on the face, it almost looks like you have, it's like a Mr. Potato Head. You have a different face on a neck and chest, but you don't necessarily have to do neck and chest every single time. And as you can see in the video, it's, it's a little white dot. So that's how, from a technician standpoint, you're basically ensuring a very, very even treatment. And all these little uh, little sun damage, these little pigmented lesions that you're seeing, you'll see in the next few slides how it shows you really, really awesome before and after pictures. So we always want to remember that you can do the neck, you can do the chest, you can do the arms, tops of the hands. Um, so make sure that you're basically really focusing on those areas when you're wearing your sunscreen too. 
Um, I want to go over this slide kind of quickly. Halo basically, uh, we say on a discomfort level, a three five to a four live four five, but everything is relative. I will say this: I've never had a patient say, "Stop! I cannot finish this treatment." Oh my gosh, this was way more intense than I thought it was going to be. It is more intense than you ever think it's going to be, and most patients will read tons of the reviews online, and it's just like anything. You never know what is exactly going to feel like until you're actually experiencing it yourself. But we as Juliana Facial Aesthetics, we really try to prepare you. I give you all little tricks of the trade to ensure that you're going to have a great treatment from start to finish. And every single patient, when I give them their follow-up call and I ask them, you know, how, how everything's going, they say, all right, it was a little bit more than I thought it was going to be. And then when I call them at about their six to eight week mark, they say, I would do that again, hands down. So that's always refreshing for patients to hear. Uh, we use a Zimmer chiller. So at the same time that we're doing our laser treatment, we're kind of compensating that heat with some uh, cold air. So it makes it very, very comfortable for patients. And you can also hold it on after uh, the treatment to kind of cool the skin down. Recovery time, that's, that's the biggest thing with Halo is we say there's a good seven to 10 days of downtime, but it doesn't mean you have to sit in your house for seven to 10 days. It's usually the first five to four to five that are pretty intense. Um, swelling, redness, a little bit of itchiness, go over great skincare to kind of get you through those stages. But if you can give us a good four to five days, the results are just uncanny and it's so worth it. And like I said, every patient will come back and say, definitely going to do that again. The results are worth it. And it's something that you typically will do once a year. Uh, moving into some photo facial or phototherapy, we have Forever Young BBL, broadband light. Cyton's technology is just, you can't compare it to any other. Um, it's awesome because from a technician standpoint, we go through lots of different um, continuing education courses and we're always, you know, looking for new techniques in the industry so that we are able to treat every type of uh, skin and every type of patient that comes in. But what broadband light does is it basically tricks your genes to act like when they were younger. So I always tell patients, you know, when you're holding up a phone and you have light that's reflecting off of your face or you're doing a filter, it basically is training your genes to reflect and refract light. So it masks impurities such as pigment, such as discoloration, redness, um, acne in the skin. And BBL is definitely recommended to do in a series whether we're doing corrective work, like trying to improve upon sun damage, vascular lesions, pigmented lesions, acne, or if you're trying to do it just preventative wise, we want to do a good three to four treatments per year. So it's kind of like the new facial, the photo facial. Um, definitely spas have their place in the industry. They're nice and relaxing. You want to take care of your skin as far as good skincare goes. But with photo facial, it goes a lot deeper. So the results are amazing. Um, whether you're correcting or whether you're just doing preventative work, it's the most visual, visual change that you're going to see as far as pigment goes. So doctors, you're just going to flip through these next uh, slides. Good thing about BBL is there's not a lot of social downtime. So where we were talking about halo, where that's resurfacing and working on the integrity of your skin, BBL, you can wear makeup the very next day. You're not going to get any peeling. You're not going to get any swelling. You'll get a little redness. Um, some of your sun damage will be a little darker than normal, but if you just spend an extra five, 10 minutes in the mirror, you can pretty much cover that up and nobody will ever know that you ever did anything. Um, difference in feeling, the BBL kind of feels like a hot rubber band snap. Um, but once you're done with the treatment, you might have a little residual redness, but it calms down after a couple hours. Uh, like I was talking about, Cyton's technology, awesome. We've got precision adapters so that we can get little vessels around the nose, little cherry angiomas. Basically think anything that has to do with pigment, BBL can target. And we use a cool ultrasound gel. You can still use the aid of a Zimmer if you need to. But as far as discomfort, patients are usually at like a one to two. The most annoying thing with BBL is you just see a bright flash of light. But we've got protective goggles on, of course, and that's the main purpose of a BBL is we want to get that light deep down into your skin. 
Um, we don't use any numbing for BBL. It's super easy. Treatment time is about 20 minutes. Love to walk patients through every little step of it. And it's one of those things that you do in a series about two to three. You'll definitely see results after one, but you see the best results once you do it in a series. And the reason why I love BBL, you can actually use it in conjunction with Halo. So for someone who comes in and they have, you know, heavy rosacea, deep, deep sun damage, we're trying to correct 15, 20 years of sun damage. Um, we hit it with the BBL first, really bring that pigment up to the surface. And then we go over it and resurface it with the halo just to give an overall really, really awesome treatment. Now I really want to get into some skincare because skincare is a huge, huge factor in prepping your skin for these types of treatment and definitely using post care. Kind of like to use the analogy of going to the gym. You, you're working it with a trainer, you go to the gym, you're doing a great workout. But if you don't come home and are continually living a healthy lifestyle, and it depends what kind of diet you're uh, using, that whole workout could kind of go to waste. So we're looking to amplify our treatments as much as possible, and we're looking to maintain the results as much as possible. And that's what we get with skincare. Um, elastin. Love, love, love elastin. We're going to look at some before and after pictures for the first um product that I'm gonna talk about, which is our nectar. This little guy right here, I call it sweet nectar of the gods. It is so amazing. I live with my two sisters. I want them to have the best skin possible, um, but I hide this from them because this is like gold and I use this every single day. So as you can see on the picture that's displayed right here, this top patient prepped with Elastin Skin Nectar and used it post care. This bottom patient did not. So you can kind of see along their journey, um, day four post procedure and day seven post procedure, there's a significant difference in their healing time. And for those patients that come in and they say, all right, Shalane, I've got a week, I've got to get back to work, I can maybe have a long weekend. This is gonna be something essential that you want to use for your treatment. This is a personal uh, patient of mine. She did a halo one year where she prepped with Elastin Skin Nectar, and then another year where she didn't. The first, page, the first picture she did not, you can see there's much more significant swelling than the second uh, picture. So AIDS in Healing has Arnica in it, has Trihex technology. You use one pump in the morning, first thing after cleansing, one pump at night, and then you can use whichever other product you want after that but it basically enhances and helps your body clear out old dead collagen that's just sitting on the surface of your skin and generating new collagen. So it's really, really gonna amplify your treatment and prep you uh, to heal a little bit quicker. Anyone who is looking to do any type of resurfacing, whether it's as light as microneedling or a laser peel or a little bit more aggressive as a halo, this is a staple and I encourage every single patient to purchase this product because I use it myself too. Um, post treatment, you're not gonna necessarily use everything under the sun because now your skin is in a condition where you're in healing mode. So we would just wanna use a couple light treat, uh, a couple light skincare um, while you're healing. And then we kind of integrate some treatments and some uh, skincare that's gonna help you heal a little bit faster. So Soothe and Protect Recovery Balm, I like this better than what most patients used to use, Vaseline or Aquaphor. It's a little bit lighter. Um, I use it even in the winter time on my lips or if I really wanna amplify another skincare, it basically puts a barrier over your skin. So it's gonna lock in moisture and it's gonna block out bacteria during healing. It hydrates comp uh, compromised skin. It replenishes the barrier function and it's really, really light. You're gonna use this for the first four to five days upon getting any type of resurfacing treatment and then you'll be able to use a lighter moisturizer after that. Such as our ultra nourishing moisturizer. Love this one, use this in the winter time because it's a little bit, uh, it's really, really hydrating. So after you receive a laser treatment, you're usually sick of your face looking a little gooped up. Then you're gonna titrate down to this little guy and it's an awesome moisturizer. Still has that trihex technology. So you're constantly building new collagen and it has some really good key botanicals in the skin. 
the one thing I really like about Elastin skincare is that it's paraben free, it's gluten free, it's cruelty free, not a lot of chemicals in it. And which brings us into the hydrogen. I wear this every single day. This is all I have on my face all day long. I use this as my makeup. It has a little bit of a tint to it. So even for me, someone who is as pale as a ghost, it gives me a little bit of color. And then someone who has a little bit more color, it kind of just blends in and you can put your makeup on, on top of that. Can't talk enough about SPF. Everyone should wear it every single day, no matter if it's sunny out because those UVB rays are penetrating through and it's just gonna enhance and prolong aging. But I love this one because you can even use it post halo while you're still trying to heal from a little bit of residual redness. So this is definitely a staple that should be in everyone's um, drawer. I keep one in my car, I keep one in my tennis bag because what did we say? You have to reapply sunscreen every two hours. Now let's talk about ZO skin health. This is something that you are either going to prep or maintain your uh, laser treatments with. Gentle cleanser, squeaky clean feeling. Love this, it's safe to use post treatment. It's great to prep with, moves your makeup really good. Um, it's essential for post treatment because we don't want you using any type of cleanser that has um, AHAs, BHAs, glycolic, lactic, salicylic acid. We just want you using something really, really light and gentle while that top layer of skin is sloughing off. Um, but I actually use this as my everyday cleanser. I kind of mix it up with a different one. I'll use this one in the morning and use up one, like I was saying, that has glycolic or salicylic acid at night to really help remove all the dirt, debris that we accumulate through the day and remove our makeup really well. But that one is one that um, we recommend to use post laser. And the next one is our retinols and non-retinols. So we have one for everyone. Some patients have super, super sensitive skin and they don't necessarily want to use a retinol. And kind of how Dr. Z was talking about retinol basically increases the cell turnover rate. So the average adult has about a 21 day cycle to regenerate new skin. So what retinols are doing is it's kind of like your one-stop shop for anti-aging via skincare. It helps with acne, helps with fine lines and wrinkles because it's increasing the cell turnover rate. So when your body creates new cells, now we maintain those and use really good skin products to basically uh, reduce the signs of aging. So we've got two options here. We have a 0.5 retinol and we have a non-retinol um, for patients who have super sensitive skin but you always have to make sure that you're, comb you're combining it with some really great sunscreen. Um, as far as lasers go, we would want you to refrain from using retinol a good seven to 10 days before. And afterwards, we wouldn't have you uh, use the, your retinols until you're done with the healing process, of course. But we go over all of that in our consultation as well. Um, this is something, these three products, flying off the shelf, amazing. We did a lot of research on what type of brightening and pigment control products we wanted to carry for patients who weren't necessarily ready to do a laser treatment or really wanted to clear up some of their initial sun damage before they actually did. So a lot of patients don't have the downtime, but they say, okay, what else can I do? And that kind of goes back to finding what's perfect for you, whether it be a treatment or whether it be skincare. So these are amazing. We go over these in our consultation because um, they're a little bit different. Whether you are dealing with heavy melasma, whether you are just finishing a series of BBLs and really trying to maintain your results um, as far as pigment and irregular irregularities go, We've got a pigment control brightening cream, has 4% hydroquinone and vitamin C. So this is gonna be the one that you're gonna use AM. We've got just a pigment control blending cream. So that is like your bold pigment or your bleaching of the skin almost. And then we have a pigment control and blending cream. Um, I've had patients who, like I said, weren't necessarily ready to do a laser treatment. So we started them on this. I was kind of sad at this because she texted me and sent me a picture and she said, 
I'm not going to do the halo because I've seen enough results in just these creams. So I was sad that she wasn't going to do the halo laser, but I was also really happy because she achieved the results that she was looking for just with these creams. Um, so she said, all right, I'm going to call you in the fall and I'm going to keep using these and then uh, we'll do a halo in the fall. So these are awesome to use instead of a halo during the summertime, as long as you're using your sunscreen as well. This is huge. We wanted to really promote all of our patients to continue using awesome skincare during this time where we're not necessarily seeing you in office. But if you go to elastin.com and zeoskinhealth.com and you select Zuliani Facial Aesthetics, you can um, get two, day free, two free day shipping. They're always running amazing promotions. Just a couple days ago, they were doing a free eye cream um, with any $195 purchase. So that's a great time to stock up on our nectar and have that. Um, but we wanted to make it easy for our patients to still be able to use the great skincare lines that we carry. So make sure that you're stocking up and using this time to really take care of your skin, prepping your skin so that when we're back in office, we are ready to go for some awesome laser treatments. All right, also wanted... I think you have a question. One is I would like BBL for acne. Can I skip that and do Halo? Or do I need to do the BBL? If so, which do I do first? Perfect question. So if you have active acne, we never want to go over any active acne with a Halo. So we might have you come in and do one to two treatments uh, via BBL using the 420 light to basically kill that initial bacteria on the skin, prevent future breakouts, maybe get you on some good skincare, um, like a exfoliating cleanser and a retinol. And once that acne calms down, then we can go in with the halo. So in order to give you the best results, we wanna kinda calm that down first and then go ahead and do the resurfacing. That's why we always recommend doing packages such as two to three BBL treatments, um, get your skin under control and then do the halo as far as resurfacing goes. That's all that on there. Is there another one? We're looking. I don't think so, but you could tell them they can always email us at info at zulianimd.com if they think of questions later. So I think the live questions are done, but uh, anybody who does have them and doesn't want to speak out right now, you could always ask us at info at zulianimd.com and we'll be happy to answer those questions there. Um, somebody just asked. Oh, there's one, there's one yep, more. I see it. Oh. Someone, want, I wanted to go over the products, um, especially the serum and the tinted SPF. Absolutely. I'm gonna go over the essentials for prepping for Halo. Elastin Skin Nectar. Awesome. And then definitely the Elastin Hydratint. It's an SPF 36. And the Ultra Nourishing Moisturizer. All three of those by Elastin. Can you explain the balm again? Yes. Soothe and Protect Recovery Balm. This is basically a barrier cream. It's going to lock in moisture, which your skin absolutely needs post a laser treatment and or if your hands are too dry from washing them too much <laughs> that's fine yes that too use it at and night it's going to block out bacteria one of the biggest questions that patients say is oh my gosh so i have to have this whole skincare regimen for pre-laser this whole skincare regimen for post and my everyday no you can definitely use this one all of them um, as your everyday skincare regimen, but it's just pertinent to use before and post laser. I use this on my lips when they're very dry. Like Dr. Z said, you can use it on the tops of your hands when it's really, really dry. Another good trick to use to use this for is using your expensive skincare. After you use that at night, put a very thin layer of the Soothe and Protect Recovery Balm and it's going to lock it in. So while you sleep, you're basically amplifying that skincare. Um, you probably wouldn't want to use it during the day because it does give you a little shiny hue. Um, but at night, that's how you're basically going to get the most bang for your buck with this one. Someone said, what do you do to diminish sun damage on the neck? 
will definitely wear your sunscreen to prevent any future damage, but BBL and Halo both can be um, applied to the neck, decollete, tops of hands and arms. So we can erase years of sun damage off of your skin with these two treatments. Can you use the retinol for something else on arms and hands for spots, et cetera? Um, you would probably go through this fairly quickly if you were using it on your body. Um, you can spot treat little pigment and lesions with the pigment control cream, um, but I just say let's schedule a BBL and it'll take it away a lot faster. And can you use with the moisturizer? Absolutely. Like Dr. Zuliani was talking about earlier, uh, retinol can make your skin a little bit dry, especially if you're super sensitive. So we always recommend using a moisturizer after a retinol for sure. Did I miss any, Karen? Okay. I think we're good. Um, I'll see, give it one more second if any pops up. In the meantime, John Carl was just gonna share about our presentation. So um, in regards to our special we're running um, for this presentation, if you are interested in a Z lightning lift, a mini facelift or a deep plane facelift, um, and book by April 10th, you'll receive a complimentary consult, which is a $100 value, as well as $500 towards your procedure, as well as we will be donating a, pr a percentage of all deposits that go, uh, will go toward our, uh, the first responder PPE fund. So um, we're going to try and do our part to help those on the front line, many of whom I know um, that are putting themselves in harm's way every day to make sure that we're safe. And they can either call the office. Oh, and to book, you can either call the <laughs> office or again, info at ZulianiMD.com and we will return your uh, inquiries. Yeah, okay. Well, if anybody, if anybody has any last questions, submit them now, if not, Hopefully everybody has gone outside and gotten a little bit of vitamin D today with putting your sunblock on. <laughs> Good job. Um, and uh, try to stay safe, stay home, eat well, sleep well, exercise well. Pretty soon, uh, I think uh, life will start getting close to normal as possible. And when it does, we'll be there uh, to help your aesthetic needs. And we'll email and put on social when, we're, when we open Yeah, and again, uh, everything is sort of day by day. We're obviously going to listen to our uh, healthcare leaders and our elected leaders as to when it would be safe to um, reopen the office. And that will be blasted on every social media channel that we have. And you will, you will know when we do. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you very much. much, everyone. Can't wait to see you in office. All right. Bye bye. bye. Okay. Now I have to do what? What? Uh, oh yeah. Follow us on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, hold on. I have to. Uh,